thanks, uh, Jose and the other organizers for inviting me. It's a pleasure to, to speak um, on such a nice uh, seminar. Um, yeah, so I wanted to, to talk about uh, <laughs> very broadly um, symmetry and, and determinantal polynomials. This is uh, based on um, a number of joint works uh, with uh, my student, Ibir Alamani, uh, Daniel Plowman, and my former student, uh, Faye. Uh, Pasley Simon. Maybe before I go on, I'll just note that uh, a beer is is currently on the postdoc job market. So if you want a a, a good postdoc who's well versed in in this area, you should consider her. Um, so the the main object of of today is going to be determinantal representations of of polynomials, linear determinantal representations of polynomials. Um, so if I have a polynomial and n variables, I might want to try and write it as the determinant of a, a square matrix whose entries are affine linear functions and the variables. If I extract all of the coefficients uh, of each variable and gather them into their own matrix, I get a representation like this, where f is the determinant of uh, a matrix of affine linear forms. Uh, where each each matrix is a deep D. Um, and I can here I've just written this as general D by D matrices, uh, but I could make any sort of restrictions that I like. I could ask that the matrices be symmetric or real or Hermitian or any number of other things. Um, and in that case, for example, if I ask all of the matrices to be symmetric, I'll say this is a symmetric determinant representation. Um, and these are sort of objects of classical algebraic geometry that have been studied for you know, uh, almost 200 years. Um, and today I want to, to talk about um, so two projects, uh, both involving symmetry in different ways. Um, and with different applications in matrix theory. Um, so project number one is going to be uh, about uh, a certain notion of invariant determinantal representation and an application to numerical range, uh, the numerical range of a matrix. Um, this is very much gonna be about polynomials that are invariant under a certain group action um, and asking what sort of representations uh, like this they might have. Um, and project uh, number two is gonna be invariance in a different way, namely invariance of the set of polynomials that have a representation like this. Um, so the invariance of the set of polynomials that one can, can write this way um, and then a, a connection to something called the principal minor end. Um, so that's the plan. Um, so let's let's jump in. <laughs> so let me first uh, talk about what the numerical range of a matrix is. Um, so if I take a a square, say D by D matrix A, um, I can look at the following subset of the complex plane. Um, I can take all of the complex numbers I get uh, by multiplying A by uh, a unit, uh, unit norm complex vector on one side and its conjugate transpose on the other side. It's a theorem uh, that this is uh, as, a, as a subset of the complex plane, this is a nice uh, compact convex set. Um, and it contains some nice information about the, about the matrix. One can think of this as you know, containing sort of strictly more information than the eigenvalues of a matrix. Um, and, uh, one can, can understand the numerical range through uh, a certain determinantal polynomial. Um, so the following is Kippenhahn's theorem, 1951. 
is that one can write the numerical range as the, the convex hull of something as all of the complex points, A plus IB, uh, where the line uh, with coefficients uh, A and B is, is tangent to the real variety of some polynomial, uh, namely the polynomial we get as the determinant of a linear matrix uh, in an X and A, uh, given by the identity matrix as a constant coefficient plus X times the, the real part of A, A plus its conjugate transpose over two, plus Y times the imaginary part of A, A minus its conjugate transpose over two I. Um, so this is, this is a, a long-winded way of saying that we take the, the real variety of, of this polynomial, which is a plane curve. We take its dual curve and then take the convex hull. And that that is actually the numerical range of the matrix. <clears throat> and so one can understand, one can try to understand numerical ranges by understanding polynomial. And just to do a small example of this. So for example, um, suppose I took the two by two matrix, uh, zero, two, zero, zero. It's not normal. Um, I can, can write the polynomial F sub A by taking the identity matrix. And then in front of X, I'm gonna put A plus its conjugate transpose over two. I'm just gonna get coefficients of, of one in the off diagonals. Uh, and then uh, in front of Y, I'm gonna get A minus A conjugate transpose over two I. Uh, I might've switched the signs on these, but up to a transpose, <laughs> I get a, an I Y and a minus I Y. Um, and then if I take the, the determinant of this two by two matrix, I get um, polynomial defining the circle. Um, and so then what do I do is I consider all lines that are tangent to the circle and I pick off the coefficients of, uh, of X and Y um, and turn them into complex numbers um, and take the convex hull. And this gives me the numerical range of this as a matrix. This gives me sort of all the values I get by multiplying A by a complex vector and their uh, conjugate transpose on the other side. And in fact, since the circle, since the circle is uh, self-dual, um, this, this circle is also going to be the numerical range. The unit circle is also going to be the numerical range of this matrix. Um, and so in this, in this project with Faye, we were interested in understanding numerical ranges that are invariant um, under rotation by certain angles in the complex plane. Um, and uh, a connection developed by Chana Natazato to something called cyclic weighted shift matrices. Um, so let me see if we can find the definition of that somewhere. Um, so a cyclic weighted shift matrix uh, is gonna be a matrix with a certain banded structure. Uh, it's say gonna be a D by D matrix with entries in, in either R or C um, that's only allowed to have certain entries non-zero. Um, so in particular, the, the J K entry is gonna have to equal zero whenever J is not equal K is not equal to J plus one mod N. We'll do an example of this uh, in a minute, but it has to have a lot of zeros. And then there's only certain sort of shifted diagonals that are allowed to have non-zero entries. Um, and I claim that in fact, uh, if you have such a matrix, then its numerical range is invariant by multiplication by nth roots of unity. And so in the complex plane, what does that do? That's rotation by two pi over n. Um, and 
let's see why this is true. Um, so I'm going to, uh, to write down a diagonal matrix consisting of the powers of uh, nth roots of unity. Um, and then use it to conjugate uh, by my matrix A. Uh, and the numerical range of a matrix, one can check just straight up from the, the definition that if I take any unitary matrix uh, U and, and conjugate, um, the numerical range won't change um, because I'm just multiplying by unit vectors in the complex uh, in, in C to the D. So for any unitary matrix, the numerical range of A is equal to the numerical range of sort of the conjugation of A. Um, but because uh, if I take a, a matrix with this very special banded structure, um, then take and this specific unitary matrix U, um, then the matrix I get here, uh, the a, let's see if we can do this. A, J, K, -th entry, it just gets scaled by uh, a root of unity, the K, the K minus J -th root of unity, assuming I've set this up correctly. Um, and so in fact, uh, if, if I zero out all of the entries, except where this is, where this value is just one, uh, then this ends up being equal to the numerical range of just uh, a scalar multiple of my original matrix. Um, so for example, here's, here's a cyclic weighted shift matrix that's a five by five, where I take n equals to three. Um, and the only non-zero entries that I'm allowing are uh, where the, diff the indices uh, differ, are, <laughs> uh, so are off by one mod three. Um, if I take such a matrix uh, and I write down the, the zero set of this determinantal polynomial I get, I get a, a picture that looks like this. I get a nice degree five plane curve. Um, and so this is the real variety of the polynomial F sub A. Uh, and if I take the all lines tangent to this plane curve somewhere and pick off their coefficients and, and take the convex hull, uh, then I get this picture on the right. And this is the a picture of the numerical range of this matrix as a subset of the complex plane. Um, and the statement uh, in this claim is that it's uh, invariant in rotation by two pi over three, just multiplication by the third root of unity in the complex plane. Um, this is something that was uh, found uh, by Chan and Nakazato. And uh, one question that they had was if, if every matrix uh, with this property that its numerical range is invariant under rotation, if every matrix uh, comes this way, or more specifically, if, if I see uh, a set like this, that's invariant under rotation, if I can write it as the numerical range of some matrix in this form. Um, and to, to answer this, one way to do this is by studying determinantal representations of, of polynomials like this. Uh, and I'll just note that just like, uh, just like the, the numerical range is invariant under rotation, the polynomials are also invariant uh, under an action of the rotation. So the polynomial F sub A is also invariant under an action of rotation by two pi over N. Um, and, and one can check that if you actually have a matrix with real entries, uh, then 
that polynomial is invariant under um, reflecting over the x changing y to minus y. Um, and so, oh, <laughs> and the and the other, um, the other necessary condition uh, for polynomials to come this way is a certain real rootedness property, um, namely that if you restrict to any lines through the origin, you get a real rooted univariate polynomial. So if you, for example, restrict uh, the, the black polynomial through, through any lines in the origin, which is in the middle of this, uh, this triangle, you'll hit this curve in, in five, no, how many? One, two, three, four, five real points, which is good because it should be a polynomial of degree five. Um, and the reason for this is that from, from a determinantal polynomial, the, the roots correspond up to sign and inversion um, to the eigenvalues of a Hermitian matrix, all of which are real. Um, and so together, in, in fact, these two conditions, invariance under rotation and real rootedness on lines through a polynomial through the origin, um, actually determine the polynomials that come this way and so determine the sorts of sets that can be numerical ranges. Um, so together with, with Faye, we proved the following uh, is if you take D to be some multiple of N and you take a, a polynomial of degree at most D uh, that evaluates to one at the origin and is real rooted uh, on any line through the origin, um, then uh, it is invariant under the action of the cyclic group uh, if and only if it can uh, be written as sort of the Kippenhahn polynomial for some cyclic weighted shift matrix uh, over the complex numbers. Um, and it's invariant under the action of the dihedral group uh, given by these two um, uh, these two symmetries, uh, if and only if it can be written as the Kippenhahn polynomial um, for some cyclic weighted shift matrix with real entries. Uh, maybe I'll just note that uh, in, in special cases where N is actually equal to D, this was proved for cubics and, uh, and in special cases for degrees four and five by Chan and Nakasato, is proved for arbitrary n equals d uh, uh, by Constantine Slentos and and Faye Simon, um, and then and then later together we were able to uh, to generalize it um, to arbitrary multiples of n. Um, and the corollary uh, for for numerical ranges of matrices um, is that if you start with any complex matrix B and its numerical range is invariant under, rota under uh, rotations by p pi over n. Um, then there's some other, then there's some other matrix that's a cyclic weighted shift matrix with the same numerical range. Um, and if the numerical range of B is invariant under conjugation, then we can take this matrix to have real entry. Uh, so this is not, not the same as saying that the, the matrices are equal, um, but they at least have uh, equal numerical range. Um, and so just as a picture, if someone hands you the numerical range of a matrix B, um, it will be bounded by some plane curve. Uh, so in this example, I took a four by four matrix B, I took its numerical range um, and the Zariski closure of this uh, is the following plane curve, the zero set of the minimal polynomial vanishing on the boundary of this. 
um, and then took its dual curve and the complex plane. And I get the following nice, uh, nice curve that's invariant under rotation and also real rooted on all restrictions through the origin. Um, and uh, this, by our theorem, I can write as the real variety of some uh, Kip and Han polynomial. Uh, and then the matrix A, I, I get this way is the desired matrix. I think in this case, A is just a nice weighted cyclic shift matrix with one, two, three, and with weights one, two, three, four. Um, so by constructing a determinantal representation, we can construct matrices with sort of desired numerical functions. Um, and I think one, uh, one interesting uh, question that comes out of this is, is what, what might be true in higher dimensions. Um, so here we had uh, an action of the cyclic group or the dihedral group um, and took a, a certain representation of it. Uh, that played nicely with our class of matrices, cyclic weighted shift matrices. Um, representations of the cyclic group are not so, there's not so many options. <laughs> um, I think uh, the more general question um, is, you know, if I have some polynomial in more variables and I have some group under which uh, it's invariant, um, can I write down a determinantal representation of the polynomial that somehow certifies its invariance? Um, so cyclic weighted shift matrices were a certificate that uh, the polynomial F was invariant under this group. Um, one might hope to, to write down um, some determinantal representation uh, that also certifies, implies the invariance of F under, under some group. Cynthia, we have a question from uh, Sir Khan, yeah. who asked, uh, are the theorems constructive? Oh, the theorem, yeah, the theorems are constructive. Um, so, uh, yeah, so the theorems are constructive. We um, can say a, a word or two uh, about the construction um, is we, we built on um, something that I had worked on with, with Daniel Plowman, building off of uh, a construction of determinantal representations of Dixon from 1902, um, where we build up um, the uh, first the adjugate matrix of of the desired um, the desired polynomial. Uh, so if you imagine you wrote down uh, F sub A is sort of the determinant, a determinant like this, I plus X times something plus Y times something. Um, <clears throat> one could consider the, the adjugate matrix of this, which is uh, going to be a D by D matrix of polynomials of degree D minus one coming from the D minus one minors. Um, and it will have certain uh, nice algebraic properties uh, with respect to this, um, this polynomial. And so the, the sort of Dixon process is to, to build up um, the adjugate matrix without actually knowing <laughs> what this, uh, what the original matrix is. Um, and so we, we did this while, uh, and, and the main sort of new thing that we had to do here was to, um, to, to use the invariance of the polynomial uh, to adapt this, this construction to deal with the symmetry, to deal with the group action. So to make careful choices of, um, of the entries here and, and how they interact with this group action. But you can't, yeah, you can't actually write down the, um, the matrices at the end. Uh, any other uh, questions on this? 
I'm going to jump to project project two. So it's a good time. Sounds good. I don't see okay. any immediate Great. questions. Great. Um, OK, so this was uh, one way uh, that we can use sort of the classical um, classical theory of determinantal representations, in this case, determinantal representations of plane curves uh, to study objects in matrix, namely the numerical range. Um, the, other, the other project I wanted to, to talk about um, is using determinantal representations of polynomials in n variables uh, to study the uh, what's called the image of the principal minor. Um, so I can do a reset <laughs> if you're uh, bored or lost. Now would be a good time to, to jump back in. Um, I'm going to introduce you to the principal minor map if you have not already seen it. Um, and its connection to determine to a different uh, flavor of determinantal representation. Um, so if I have, so first off, what's a principal minor? I have a square matrix. Now my matrices are going to be n by n. A principal minor I get by taking a, a subset of, of any size of the rows and the exact same subset of the columns, and then taking uh, the determinant um, of the corresponding principal submatrix uh, of my matrix A. And I write A sub S for the determinant of that uh, submatrix. Um, and one can uh, pick off the principal minors as actually the coefficients of a determinantal polynomial. So that's the, the connection of the day. Um, namely, if I take a diagonal matrix with n variables uh, and I add the matrix in question and take the determinant, um, then you can note that, uh, <laughs> that what are the coefficients? So for example, the the constant coefficient, I could just by plugging in all the variables uh, equal to zero is the determinant of A. That's the, the big, the principal minor corresponding to taking all of the rows and all of the columns. Um, if I take the coefficient of X sub one, uh, then, then what do I get? I'm going to, uh, I'll have used up that row and column uh, to pick off X one. Um, and what's left is I'll be taking, um, the principal minor of A, where I remove the, the first row and I remove the first column. Um, so in fact, uh, you can convince yourselves that if you take the monomial expansion of this polynomial, what you get uh, is the, the principal minors, the two to the n principal minors of A, uh, and then the times the complementary monomials. We're here, uh, ooh, sorry. <laughs> by x, x, x to some subset t, I mean the product of the corresponding variables in that subset. Um, so this is a nice polynomial. It has degree uh, at most one in, in each variable, degree exactly one in each variable. Um, and if I have, if someone hands you a, a mystery vector of, of two to the n numbers corresponding to, to subsets of n, and you want to know if they're the principal minors of some, some matrix A, that's exactly asking for determinantal representations of this form. That's asking if the, the corresponding uh, uh, multivariate polynomial um, can be written as, the, as a determinant. Um, so this question, determining um, if, if a, a vector is the principal minors of some matrix, this is the, known as the principal minor problem. 
Um, and so what I want to talk about is sort of viewing this, uh, how it can be helpful to view this through the lens of determinantal planning. Um, okay, uh, so uh, in various papers uh, by, by Berend, uh, Berend and Olga uh, Holtz for uh, symmetric matrices, Berend and, and Xiaowei Lin uh, for non-symmetric matrices, um, have studied the image of the space of symmetric matrices and non and general matrices under this map, under the map that uh, that takes a square matrix to its vector of uh, principal minors. And they've showed that uh, this is closed in the Euclidean topology uh, and that it's invariant under a certain large group. Um, namely, uh, the action of the symmetric group uh, and the action of n copies of the special linear group SL2C. Um, and in fact, so the, the symmetric group is, is not too hard to imagine how the symmetric group uh, acts on this. It acts on permuting the indices of the, um, the subset S. Uh, the action of SL2 is more interesting. Um, and in, in my mind, the best way to, to understand it is actually using um, this polynomial representation of this problem. Uh, so here are here are the actions. Um, can you see this? Yes. Um, so in order to define uh, define this action, I'm going to make this identification between this vectors of length two to the n uh, and polynomials in x one through x n uh, with degree at most one in each variable. So both. Um, perfectly good vector spaces of, of uh, dimension two to the n over C. Um, and I'm gonna be using exactly this identification. Um, and then as, as I suggest, if we have some permutation, it can act on polynomials like this by permuting the n variables around. Um, and if I have an action of the SL2, um, this, this acts by fractional linear transformations on the variable. So for example, if I let, um, let an element act on the first variable, I have n copies, so one will, one will act on each, each variable. If I left it act on the first variable, then I can replace, uh, replace uh, x1 by a Mobius transformation by a fraction the following fractional linear transformation, and then clear denominators so I get back a polynomial. I can check that if I start off with something of degree one in each variable, then I end up with something with a polynomial and a polynomial of degree uh, at most one in each variable. Um, and if I then pick off, pick off the coefficients uh, of, of all of these monomials, I'll get, get the desired, um, I'll get how SL2 acts um, on these vectors. And so the fact that it's, uh, that this principal minor map is invariant under SN is easy, you could do it right now. The fact that it's invariant under this action of SL2 uh, to the end requires a bit more thought and work. Um, this is a very abridged uh, version, uh, history of, of this problem. Um, but uh, so in this paper with, with Olga and Bernd discussing the symmetric version of this, this problem, um, they show that uh, the two by two by two by two by two hyperdeterminant uh, vanishes on this, this image um, and conjecture that, uh, the, the orbit of, of this polynomial under this large group action actually cuts out the image of the principal minor map uh, set theoretically. Um, and this was later proved by Luke Oding, um, who used tools from, from representation theory um, 
uh, to, to study this image. So this is for symmetric symmetric matrices. We can, we can cut out this image with the orbit of a single polynomial under a large group back. Um, and, and so what I wanna do is, is talk about how one can understand this using uh, determinantal polynomials as, as well. Um, to make this connection, I need a little bit, uh, a little bit more notation. Uh, I need to define something called the the Rayleigh difference of a polynomial, uh, which is the following. Um, if uh, so, for any i and j in one through n, um, this is going to be an operator that eats a polynomial. Um, and sends it to the following. I'm gonna take uh, the derivative of f with respect to the ith variable, multiply it by the derivative of f with respect to the jth variable, uh, subtract off f uh, times the derivative of f with respect to both variables. Um, so this, if I, in particular, if I start off, if f has degree at most one in each variable, the result will be something of degree at most two in each variable. Um, and you can check that, uh, that in fact, if f has degree at most one in each variable, uh, then the result uh, that this will, this, this operation will get rid of the appearances of, of x, i, and x, j. Um, these polynomials uh, were, were central to a characterization of something called stable polynomials by Peter Grantham. Um, and what we'll see here is they also have a nice connection to, to, to term, determinantal polynomials. Um, and the, determin and the, the connection uh, is as follows, um, is there's a, there's a nice matrix identity uh, going back to, I think the 1860s, Dodgson, um, that says if you have, um, that if you want to compute, that was used for computing determinants of matrices before computers made this very easy. Um, if you want to compute the determinant of a big matrix, um, you can, compute it using a series of determinants of smaller matrices. Um, namely, you can, if you take the determinant of a big matrix and then take the, multiply it by the determinant of uh, a co-dimension two matrix, so cross out uh, a column and a row and then another column and the same row. Uh, get the determinant of a little, say, n minus two by n minus two matrix. This product uh, is equal to a sort of two by two minor in the determinants size d minus one. Um, so namely, if you cross out, say, the last row and last column and take the determinant of the corresponding matrix, multiply it by the determinant you get by crossing out the first row and first column, subtract off the, the minor you get by crossing out the first row and last column times the minor uh, from deleting the first row and last column, uh, that this expression is equal to the product of the big determinant times the determinant of the D minus two uh, principal self matrix. And so in fact, so the original idea was to compute the big determinant um, as uh, by this expression and then dividing by the D minus, um, the D minus two size minor. Um, the connection here is that if I have, uh, if I have a polynomial F uh, determinant of X one through XN plus A, um, then, as we said before, the, the principal 
minor, um, the determinant of the submatrix um, of, of this matrix I get by crossing out the last row and column is exactly the derivative of, of f with respect to the variable x of n. Um, and similarly, if I take this matrix uh, and, and I want the determinant of the, the, the principal minor uh, given by deleting the first row and, and column, that's exactly the same as taking the derivative of f with respect to x1. Um, and then similarly, the whole determinant is will be f uh, and the n minus two principal minor is gonna be given by the derivative of f with respect to both variables. Um, and so what this says uh, is, this gives a relation on the, the product of the two derivatives uh, and, and f times both derivatives and says it has to actually, um, what's left in this expression um, is gonna be a product of two determinants of, of submatrices here. Um, in particular, if we rearrange this expression, if we move, um, this to one side and this to the other side, uh, we find an, an expression uh, for these Raleigh differences. Um, so in particular, if, if my polynomial F has a representation like this, uh, then it's Rayleigh difference can be written as the product of, of two polynomials coming uh, as uh, N minus one by N minus one minors of this matrix. Um, in particular, if the matrix is symmetric, then these subdeterminants are going to be the same, and this polynomial has to actually be a square. Um, so, what's the point? Uh, so, one way, uh, so one nice consequence of this is we can actually see this gives one explanation for why the hyperdeterminant. Um, uh, vanishes on the image of the principal minor map. Um, in particular, if you start with a polynomial of degree three um, and you want to know if it uh, has a determinantal representation, um, so you can take a delta one, two, this will be a polynomial in a single variable, x3, and you can take its discriminant. That's a, how you would test if a, a quadratic polynomial in one variable is a square. And in fact, if you do this, the, the discriminant of this, this Rayleigh difference is actually spot on equal to Cayley's two by two by two hyperdeterminant, which is the following beautiful uh, quartic polynomial um, in the end case. Um, and so, uh, so with a beer, we were able to show. I was able to show the following: uh, is that one can use this to test uh, for being in the image of the principal minor map. Um, namely, if I have some vector uh, whose entries are uh, indexed by subsets of n, and I write down the the corresponding polynomial of degree at most one in each variable, um, then the following are equivalent. Uh, one is that this, this polynomial has a type of determinantal representation we want, meaning that the vector is in the image of the, the principal minor map uh, of some symmetric matrix. Um, the other is that all of these, uh, these Rayleigh difference, delta ij of f, are squares uh, in, the, in the polynomial ring. You can write them all as squares. Um, and then the last is that exactly uh, that these, all these discriminants vanish uh, is that um, the, that A lies in the variety of the orbit of the hyperdeterminant under the action of these. 
Um, so this, this gives another way of, of showing this result uh, by look that one can cut out the image of the principal minor map um, from the orbit of a single equation under this large group action. Um, and I'll say that we, so this, this I thought was um, to me, who <laughs> sort of enjoys determinants of representations, um, uh, I thought this was, uh, to me, this was a very nice way of, of understanding this and connecting sort of two uh, questions in, in classical algebraic geometry. Um, and I had hoped that, uh, or we had, had, had hoped and thought for a while that the, this story would extend in some ways to the case for general, uh, general matrices. Um, and in fact, something, uh, something quite different happens. Um, and so in the last four, four minutes or so of the talk, um, I'll, I wanna just uh, tell you um, the slightly different uh, type of result that we get for, for general matrices. Um, so for, for symmetric matrices, we found that the image of the principal minor map was cut out uh, by a single, the orbit of a single equation under a large group action. Um, and in fact, for general n by n matrices, um, we find is there's is almost the exact opposite. Uh, is that there's no finite set of polynomials whose, whose image under this group action cuts out the image of, of uh, square matrices under the principal minor map for every n. Um, so whereas here we had the orbit of a single equation in general um, for non-symmetric matrices, the not, only, not only is there not one equation, um, but there's no finite set of, of, of equations whose orbit under this group action will cut out the image. Um, how much time? Two minutes. Okay. Uh, well, um, and so just to give a, a taste of, of why this is true, suppose we let uh, I sub n denote the ideal of polynomials vanishing on the image of uh, n by n matrices under the principal minor map. Um, I'm gonna, uh, the, the example um, that we use to show this is the following uh, polynomial uh, in 2n plus 1 variables, uh, where here we sort of identify x of 2n plus 2 with x2. A nice, uh, nice multivariate polynomial of degree at most 1 uh, in each of, of 2n plus 1 variables. Um, and in fact, uh, this polynomial. Uh, the coefficient vector of this um, belongs to any polynomial that you can get from the, the image of the 2n, uh, image of the principal minor map of 2n by 2n matrices. Um, uh, and then use the large, large group action any polynomial you can get like this will be fooled by this, uh, by the coefficient vector of this polynomial. Um, but uh, this polynomial itself doesn't have a nice determinantal representation. You can't write it, uh, it doesn't, um, its coefficient vector is not in the image of the principal minor. Um, and one, one direction of this exactly comes from these Raleigh differences and uh, endogenous condensation is that if you, if you take the Raleigh difference of, uh, of this polynomial, one can, can write it down as uh, a product of 
um, 2n plus 1 uh, irreducible, irreducible polynomials. Um, and in fact, these irreducible polynomials form a sort of uh, form a, a cycle in terms of the variables that they use in such a way that you can't write it as a product of, of two, two polynomials of degree at most one in each variable. Um, and so using this, this dodge and condensation trick, which has now disappeared, uh, we can't write this uh, as a determinant. And so this, um, so this this was something that uh, happened quite recently and was was very surprising to us uh, that the the situation for for general matrices is is a lot more interesting um, than the situation for symmetric matrices, uh, and so very open question would be to. To find what equations, find equations, uh, cut out the image of general matrices under the principle. Um, and and what this this work with the PR shows is, in fact, <laughs> you're going to have to to add add equations um, as you go up uh, that, that a group action will not, um, will not be enough uh, to, you can't get away with uh, <laughs> just, just finding a set of equations and then using this nice large uh, group action. Okay, um, so I'm already out of time. Uh, so hopefully uh, these two projects give you a flavor for, um, for how one can use uh, uh, determinantal representations of, of polynomials to, uh, to address um, interesting questions in, uh, in matrix theory, such as understanding numerical ranges or such as understanding the principal minor map. Um, and maybe with that, I will, I will stop. Oh, thanks for the wonderful talk, Cynthia. Uh, if people have questions, feel free to post them in the chat and Q&A. I see one thing in the Q&A. So Carlos uh, says, uh, can you please comment on any implications, applications to DPPs, determinantal point process in probability or statistics? Um, yeah, so uh, we don't have... Um... So, so if you so determinantal point processes is is one nice uh, application of these is where you sort of consider sampling a, a subset of one through n with probability proportional to um, proportion uh, sorry probability of picking s uh, proportional to the the principal minor. Um, um, yeah, so this is this is one reason that one might want to to understand the image of the principal minor map. Um, in terms of uh, of applications, um, to me the the most interesting application is actually something I didn't talk about, um, which is um, um, if you. You, you might want to you might want to do this um, regardless of whether the, the matrix A is is symmetric. Uh, and what do I want to say? Um, a, a very nice it, um, okay. Sorry. <laughs> um, one way that you can get uh, negative dependence. Um, in distributions like this um, is guaranteed uh, by having this polynomial, uh, f of x, this generating polynomial for this distribution have a property called stability. Uh, 
um, which one way of writing this down is that um, it has no zeros in the upper half plane uh, or points where the imaginary part of Z lies in the positive orthant. Um, and so in fact, uh, so this is this is a nice, uh, in addition to, to general determinant of point processes, this, this gives you a, a nice class of, of probability distributions that have uh, negative dependence. Um, and so one could ask, uh, in particular, for which, which stable polynomials um, have determinantal representations like this. Um, and one corollary of, of this work with a beer uh, that I decided to cut for time uh, was that if you have uh, a polynomial like this, so A, S, X, and S, and it's uh, determinantal, uh, and stable, um, then it actually has, you can, can write it, um, uh, then you can take the, the matrix here to be Hermitian. So you can write uh, F. Uh, with, with a Hermitian. Um, so if you have a determinantal point process and it has um, certain properties uh, relating to negative dependence, uh, then you can take the, the matrix in question to be a Hermitian matrix. Um, so I don't know that <laughs> I don't know that's exact uh, question to you, uh, exact answer to your question. Um, Carlos says nice, many okay. thanks. Mm -hmm. yeah. And then I guess one final question before we break for uh, informal discussion is by Moroni asking, do all convex bodies in R2 arise as numerical range of some matrix? Ah. It is known, conjectured, or is there a counterexample? Yeah, I can give you a counterexample. Um, uh, yeah, so um, I can give you a counterexample because I can give you a counterexample to the dual statement. Um, so, so I, I told you that this variety of F sub A, this Kippenhahn polynomial, um, had this real rootedness property. Um, so if I take, I took, let's write it down again. So if I took F sub A and I restricted to any line through the origin, I got something real rooted. Um, and so, in fact, to, to get a counterexample uh, to, to this question, to cook up a convex semi-algebraic uh, set that's not the numerical range, um, I could first write down uh, a polynomial. For example, uh, F is maybe the boundary of the be one minus x to the four minus y to the four. Um, this bounds something convex, sort of <laughs> rounded square, um, uh, but it doesn't have this real rootedness property. If I restrict through lines through the origin, I only find two real points, not four. Um, so in fact, if I took, so if I wanted a counterexample, uh, so if I took the, uh, the dual curve, so I took the real variety of this polynomial F and took the dual curve, uh, meaning I take all the lines tangent to this and pick off their coefficients and then, uh, and then take the convex hull of this. <clears throat> um, probably we could even figure, this, figure out what this is. Um, but this convex set uh, cannot be the numerical range um, of a matrix. The convex hull of the dual curve can't be the numerical range of a matrix um, because I would be able to go back 
um, I would be able to take the boundary of this set and take its stool and get my way back to the to the TV screen. Um, yeah. Uh, so there's right. lots of lots of convex sets that are not numerical. Right. Right. Melanie I, says, I see. Oh, go ahead. You yeah, I have one question uh, back. Yeah. So you defined it uh, that uh, it's stable if the Im imaginary part is uh, posi uh, positive, uh, negative should be. So should, uh, the roots should all be uh, with imaginary part uh, positive. And in systems and control theory, uh, typically you do the real part should not be positive, should all be negative. So. Uh, and, and, and there's quite a lot of work also with numerical range uh, there. So could you explore uh, what's the connection? <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so that, so. Um... I mean, why they want to have it in the negative part is if you look <laughs> at a dynamical system, then it's stable exactly then when uh, the roots of the polynomial. Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, there's, there's also interesting things to be done replacing this with real part. Um, yeah, I think um, so. So people study this with respect to various uh, regions and half planes in the complex plane. Yeah. Um, the in order to get sort of this negative de negative dependence, um, that this is sort of the thing to take. Uh, and also, if you if the connection with real rooted polynomials, if I think mm -hmm. of this as a polynomial in a single variable mm -hmm. with real coefficients, um, so. Uh, then, so if f is in, let's say, a single polynomial, yeah. then then having no zeros in the upper half plane also means having no zeros in the lower half plane, mm -hmm. um, and and so then stability is is equivalent to real rootedness. Real. Um, and so that's that's the that's one connection uh, between. Um... But I mean, you, you see in systems theory, stable means uh, that uh, if you look at the differential equation, uh, you know, it, it exponentially decays uh, to the origin. <laughs> yeah. If the characteristic polynomial, and so that's why you call it stable. <laughs> uh, yeah, so. Um, so usually this comes with with adjectives. I think Hervitz stable is is stable with respect to the right half plane, um, and and the the prevalence of of this this type of stability, um, people have just started shortening it to uh -huh. uh, to just to just stable polynomial. Um, but they're yeah they're closely. I mean, there, it's everything conformally can be bought from one <laughs> to the other. And yeah. actually, they also study, you know, that uh, it's stable if all the roots are in, in the unit circle mm -hmm. inside, yeah. because I there the that's... meaning is for in discrete dynamical system. That's the requirement that it becomes yeah. stable. Um, so I think that's sure stability. Yeah. So I think it, they, they all, the so this is one flavor of stability <laughs> that, that has nice, um, yeah, that has nice connections to sort of uh, of negative dependence. But yeah, there, there's there's other flavors of stability, um, mm -hmm. and there and as you say, they're all one can go in between them <laughs> um, using these Mobius transformations. Yeah. Um, awesome. Very good. Well, I'll pause the recording now, and thanks, Cynthia, again. Mm -hmm.